You are listening to Nerd Best Friends, a podcast that covers the nerdy conversations you're already having, or wish you could. It's the nerdiest thing you'll do this week. Welcome back to the Nerd Best Friends podcast. I am Annalise, and I'm here with my best friend, Ra. Hey, it's me, Rob, your best friend, your podcast host, and your 80s kid. The Nerd Best Friends podcast can be found on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, and more. Subscribe and follow us today. If you'd like to support our podcast, find us on Venmo or click on tip jar at nerdbestfriends.com. This is season two, episode 31, and today we compare two films with the second in our series, I've Seen This Before. But first, Rob's recommendations. So this time I am going to recommend something that's on the tip of everybody's tongue these days, and that is ChatGPT. I've been messing around with ChatGPT a ton lately, especially really for work, right? It, I've been reading a bunch of articles and figuring out a lot of little shortcuts that has made ChatGPT save me time at work, especially in my writing. But for our purposes, I'd like to kind of put everybody in the direction of messing around with ChatGPT for your RPGs, especially if you are someone who needs starters or you need to flesh out some of your details because it ha- it knows everything that's published on the web. It knows what a D&D game is. It knows how to format a Dungeons and Dragons adventure. It knows how to write plot hooks. It can give you names and surnames of characters that you need to bring in just by starting a conversation of, "Hey ChatGPT, I want to design a five-room dungeon or a five-room dungeon for a Dungeons and Dragons game that I'm playing with my friends. Do you have any suggestions?" And it'll give you a list of plot hooks. Ooh, I like number five. Let's explore that some more. And it'll flesh that out. Ooh, we need a plot twist. What could that be? And it's going to give you a list of plot twists. Oh, I like this number three. So now let's think of the rooms. The first one's going to be a library. Can you give me a description of a fantasy library that might appear in a Dungeons and Dragons module? Boom. Here's your flavor text paragraph that you can write. It saves time and it's just kind of fun. I've been messing around with it for little Dungeons and Dragons, things like that. The next thing that I'll do probably is either with a Star Wars setting or a science fiction setting to just look at some ideas even if i never use them it's a fun exercise to see what it can do and again just save time for that like oh i need some when i do homebrew stuff i don't usually write out a ton of the details to read like i would find in a published adventure but with this because it takes a while and i'm like "Eh, i'll just wing it but you know what i could probably do a better job if i read it like that and i wouldn't forget the things that i like to do when i write my settings and when i give that flavor text I want to make sure that I touch on all five senses. When you walk into this cave, what are the sounds you hear? What are the smells that assault your nostrils? What is the feeling of the earth underneath your feet? Is it damp? Is it dry? Is it cold? All of those things. And if I feed that in, especially ahead of time, like I can just tell it, hey, whenever you write me a description for a setting for my Dungeons and Dragons adventures, be sure you include all five senses in your description. It'll do that every time from now on while it generates that thing for me. And then I won't forget while I'm at the table. I mean, it sounds like AI. Is it an app? Yes, this is AI. This is ChatGPT is the open AI mainstream. This is the, got this it, is, got it. these are the guys that blew open this AI craze that everybody's doing. So to the point, like most of the time, if you get these AI apps, all those apps are doing is feeding ChatGPT what you type in, but also showing you ads. Oh, like, how funny. So open AI ChatGPT is, is the one. Okay. So now we go to nerd mail. Nerd mail. Yeah, so since we started our TikTok account, the nerd mail has turned into send us all the reels and TikToks of everything Mm. we talk about. So what's really cool is we're building a little bit of a following there and that people are either interacting with the content we're putting out or they're listening to the episode and sending us reels like, hey, look at here's a video of Allison winning the, you know, the contest. Here's a reel of this. Oh, you guys talked about this. Here's a reel of this. It's cool. I love that. 
it slowed down the nerd mail, but it has okay. brought all of these links. Like people are like link, 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 link. So, I mean, I say link, that's probably the old person term. They're just they're <laughs> forwarding us reels or they're not even reels, TikToks uh, about different things. So that's been really cool. And our, our listenership is growing. So that's exciting. Well, that's awesome. Well, thank you for taking the dive and doing the nerd best friend TikTok on Elise because not all heroes w- wear capes and I certainly didn't want to do it. Okay, Rob, now into the episode. Last season we did, I've seen this before, and what was it? Remind me, it was The Matrix and... The Lego Lego movie. movie? That's right, The Lego movie. We didn't really intend to bring that back, but we got a wonderful pitch about doing another version of that this season from Andrew. So welcome back to the podcast, Andrew. How's it going, everyone? Love being a part of an audio-only media format because it means I don't have to wear pants. I assure you, everyone, I made Andrew wear pants. He is sitting next to me. (laughs) (laughs) I can also Uh, assure you I have no idea. In classic fashion, Andrew is always trying to weasel his way back onto the podcast. And so he came up with another episode of I've Seen This Before. At first, I wasn't quite sure. I really was hesitant about this one. I thought, well, all movies are the same if you really think about, you know, the format. But as we got into it and as he started reminding me about these two movies, he was right. Without further ado... Our film begins with a voiceover narration from our protagonist, a young man with a name that starts with W. In order to ignore the hardships he faces in life, the W hero finds escape in his nerdy hobby. Our W protagonist has a hero worship for a foundational entertainment personality of the past. We learn that this mentor figure greatly regrets splitting up with his friends. This movie features cameos and cameos and cameos. The soundtrack is all 80s music. The W protagonist assembles a team of lovable scamps, including a love interest. The villain of our story is a CEO of a large corporation that desires the power and prestige of the setting that is our protagonist's domain, but doesn't understand the intangible value like our heroes do. The antagonist, of course, has a cartoonishly evil right-hand man. There is the threat of property loss. Our heroes execute a kidnapping. A large crowd is gathered. At the last moment, the villain goes to desperate lengths to shut down all of the hero's plans and succeeds. Just when the audience thinks it's over, it's not. In the end, the heroes are met with a cheering crowd celebrating their achievements. And just when you think it's actually over, there's still more. The movie we're talking about, of course, is the Ready Muppets. Player One. Yes, we are talking about Ready Player One and The Muppets. And to be clear, Rob, can you tell us which version of The Muppets we are talking about? This is The Muppets. Came out in 2000. Th- shoot. I know uh, it's the one with Jason Segal and like Amy Adams, right? Absolutely. This is the... The Muppets with Jason Segal from 2011. 2011. This story all about Walter, who is a little Muppet living in the regular world. He's a huge Muppets fan. He loves Kermit the Frog. He lives with his brother, who's like a regular dude played by Jason Segal. You see him ha- be kind of made fun of because he likes Kermit the Frog so much. He's got a Kermit watch. He watches old VHSs all the time. He makes Kermit cosplay for Halloween and stuff like that. He's just a super huge nerd. Where on the other hand, of course, in the movie Ready Player One, which came out in 2018, follows, of course, uh, Wade Watts, who's living in a dystopian future. The dystopian t- future of Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. In, I, it's called like the Stacks. Yep. Where it's all. Wait, these- isn't he? He's in, he's in Ohio. He's in Columbus, Ohio. I thought it was Washington, D.C. He's in Columbus, Ohio. It's in Columbus, Ohio. Oh, you're right. My bad. Which is funny because those buildings would not last an Ohio winter, no matter how dystopian. Right, because they're be. all open. It's like shipping containers yeah. with holes yeah. in them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I'm sorry. Continue. And of course, Wade Watts, in order to escape this hellscape he lives in, retreats to the Oasis, which is this, it's a video game, but it's also like this network and hub that exists in virtual reality. He, of course, is a big fan of James Halliday, who is the creator and developer of the Oasis. 
Annalise, did you see neither of these movies before we decided to do this? I had not seen Ready Player One because I always try to read the book before watching the film Mm -hmm. and just hadn't gotten around to reading the book. But I had seen The Muppets. And in fact, 2011, I must have liked it so much. I have the digital, a digital copy in my Apple library. Nice. So I must have bought like the DVD plus digital movie or Blu-ray plus v- digital movie. And I saw the stats on it. I had never watched it. <laughs> so oh. I had seen it before and I must have bought the thing and downloaded the digital copy and then never watched it again. So sometime in 2011, I saw it in the theaters and really liked it. So I, I what I didn't remember a lot of the plot other than Jason Seagal was in it. I forgot there was so much singing in it. I forgot there was Amy Adams. I forgot it was such a stellar cast, including some of the old Muppets actors. Some of the old Muppet Show actors make yes. cameos. And in your early description, you guys are right. Both of these movies have insane amount of cameos, but the Muppet movie takes that one for sure. There's so many celebrities who did that film. Which makes sense because, you know, I mean, it's it references constantly the nostalgia of the Muppet show and also their first movies, the Muppet movie, which I love. And they're part of my childhood. And, you know, the whole thing with the Muppet show was every week was a different celebrity guest. They did that same thing in the Muppet movie in 1979, where if you had been on the Muppet show and had a good time, they invited you back to be in a cameo in that movie. Very similar format in this one. In Ready Player One, though, it takes a completely different way to do that cameo where it's IPs, right? It's all of these characters from different video games and different movies, and not just characters, also robots and vehicles and Mm -hmm. things. I will say the one thing I thought was really brilliant in both of them is the level of nostalgia, right? I think, Rob, you and I are the right kind of age to get the full scope of what's happening in both of those films. And I think what really hit me in terms of quote unquote cameos in Ready Player One were almost Easter eggs themselves, right? They mentioned Robert Robert Zemeckis right? The, the Zemeckis cube, and it had a very particular thing. But if you're paying attention, there are audio cues. There are bits and pieces yes. of the Back to the Future soundtrack. There's bits and pieces of these brilliant pieces that were written for Zemeckis movies that are sprinkled throughout that paint what's going on on the screen so naturally. It's like, whoa, it's like I'm watching a movie, uh, a, like a Hughes movie or a Zemeckis film from the 80s. It is so heavily nostalgic. Full, both are full of Easter eggs, right? Yes. Muppets yes. is full of Easter eggs for the Muppet Show and for that original movie. I mean, they've got the big Jack running after the car, yes. like yes, 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 yes. <laughs> kind of thing. And then just Easter egg after Easter egg, whether it's a poster on the wall or the clothes that someone's wearing or. Ready Player One does a good job and a bad job of those Easter eggs. There's a lot of stuff that happens in the background visually that is awesome to see and never explained. Right. right. Which is my my favorite kind of reference is when you just let the audience see those things. Oh, it's that guy. Oh, it's that guy. Oh, I remember that thing. Oh, and it's just kind of in the background. Yeah. The movie also does a really, I find, over the top job of explaining things or like overly explaining jokes and things when it comes to those those Easter eggs and those references. Which is actually on par with the book. Did you ever get a chance to read the book? No. Gotcha. The book. So I broke it, my rule for this. Ah. (laughs) Andrew, have you read the book? Uh, no. Okay. I would say because, and I I don't know how you get around this in the book because it's a book, but it is an entire novel of explaining the joke, right? Mm, It is, oh, okay, so this person, you know, Halliday loved this video game, and then two pages of explaining what this video game is. And it's like, I don't need that. I'm reading this book because I'm here for the 80s references and nostalgia. I don't need two pages of you, you telling me what Pac-Man is, you know. But it is it is aimed at youth in 2018, right? It's a young adult novel. So those young adults needed that reference. And I think that's one of, one of the big arguments about the film versus the book is that for the, you know, think someone who is Andrew's age now in 2018, your 13, 14, 15 year olds, all that stuff visually is just going to go right by them. Just right. Unless they had parents that let them watch all of that stuff or pay attention to all of that stuff from the eighties. The movie visually is more clues for our age versus the book that's telling them what these things are to make them purposeful. Yeah. And I feel like if you're someone who like just likes books and doesn't like video games and doesn't and isn't like 
in that space, then I think it does make sense that you're not going to get or like understand, not understand, that feels weird to say, but like right away, you're not going to have the sort of background knowledge of, oh, that's kind of like this, or I know about that from this. It's necessary, I think. Like, it makes sense why they put it in, but I think it does really slow it down in the movie. I was going to say, one of the advantages that the movie has in that respect is there are a lot of things that you can see in the movie that are not in the book for the younger audience, right? There's a squad of Master Chiefs from Halo running around. Right. There's, what's her name? Tracer right. from Overwatch bouncing around. Right. There's a lot of new video game references visually that they don't have to explain or they don't have to talk about because it's not part of the story or the original novel, but they're there for younger viewers to get that same experience. Oh, it's that guy. Oh, it's that guy. Oh, it's that thing. Well, I will say watching the two back to back, basically. Rob, I, I side on your initial reaction. I feel like Ready Player One is much more comparable to maybe the Hunger Games with the dystopian beat the system. We've got to play this game to do this thing and win and tear down. And and especially once is uh, it's not Walter. Wade. Ready Player One is once Wade gets to the rebellion hideouts, it really, really sang to me more like Hunger Games than it did the Muppets. So I am interested in this comparison between the two movies as I've seen this before. I think the difference there that I don't think you're going to get in a Hunger Games dystopian is just the overall theme of having a character that exists. Both of these movies have a character that exists in two worlds and they kind of fight internally about where that importance is and where they belong, right? You get like one of the most excellent scenes is the song Am I a Muppet or Am I a Man? And, I love that song. Yes. Right. Just absolutely amazing. And that is, you know, Walter struggling with where do I belong? I've always been in this one world. I love my brother. And that's where my comfort zone is versus now I've met all these other friends and they're like me and they're encouraging me to be part of this world as well. And where do I really belong? And that's the same in Ready Player One, right? We've got this character who, you know, he's finding love and friendship and everything in one world, but the other on the other side, he exists in this other world that is very real and he, he has very real problems there that need to be solved and those kinds of things. If I push back on that, Katniss finds herself as the incidental face of a movement that she was unaware of. If you go through the entire series of those books or movies, they're building her up to be the face of this rebellion. And she has no idea until she gets to the point that she realizes, oh, I'm the face of this rebellion. And now I have this conscious choice of do I carry on this persona of the, you know, I even forget what they call her. The girl on fire. Yeah. And there's something else with the bird. They call her as well. But, you know, she wants to just go back home and live this simple life that she had. She also has this, I'm the face of a rebellion that's going to take down the big evil empire that's holding us all down. And the reason why we scrape for food and bread and supplies, she also has those moments, especially in that two part finale of that film. So maybe it's I've seen this before times three. <laughs> I mean, I haven't watched Hunger Games very recently, and I'm not sure why we're talking about it in the first place. But I think the internal struggle of the main character in that movie is not the leading the rebellion like Ready Player One is. I think they both kind of fall into that. I think the struggle for the character in Hunger Games is, am I a murderer or not? Right? Like, when I think about that, like, she has to kill people, and she fights against that more than because she always wants to be the rebellion like i think they like hang a lampshade on it in one of the first scenes when she's out with her boyfriend like hunting rabbit kind of thing and they have a conversation about how much she hates the evil empire and wants to take it down i think the internal struggle for that character is about killing people i think that's true if you're talking about the first couple we're bringing it up because if you take ready player one and compare it to the last two hunger, hunger games movies they are identical she does actually change from that. Am I a murderer? Right. She's always, she's always expanded the boundaries. She's always been a bit of a rebel, but she has to make a conscious choice at some point to be the face of the rebellion and, and go on live kind of like, uh, Wade does at the end to rally the troops. He gets on a live across all the screens, if you will. She has to do the same exact thing in Hungary. It's like for me watching these two, I'm, my whole point is I don't see as much comparison into the Muppets movie. But that's how the Muppet movie is. They have to get on a big screen and have their telethon and get that's, everybody to rally up the... <laughs> that's <laughs> like I true. Said, it's every Hollywood movie, right? <laughs> movie. You're, you're not wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All I got from Hunger Games in terms of like internal dilemma was um, which hot boy do I want to kiss? I mean, that, that tracks. Right, but there's no love triangle in either of the two movies we're talking about today. No. 
speaking of the two movies we're talking about today, I thought these movies were so similar that I would have bet a thousand dollars that the CEO characters that both of them were played by Ben Mendelsohn, who is the CEO guy in Ready Player One. I literally thought one of the things like why Andrew had this idea is because that guy is playing the same character in both movies, but it's actually Chris Cooper in The Muppets. But as we're watching play- Ready Player One, I was like, oh, that's right. These guys are the exact same guy wearing the exact same suit, playing the exact same character. I even Googled it. I didn't Google it. I chat GBT it, asked chat GPT to give me a list of all the characters that Ready Player One and the Muppets have in common. And it was like, oh, there's one character in common. It's Ben Mendelsohn, and he plays the CEO in both movies. I was like, oh, okay, cool. That's what I thought. It was wrong. The same way I was wrong. Evil guy of an evil empire white guy. Very one He's kind of an idiot and yep, yep. has a chip on his shoulder and... Interestingly, in Ready Player One, you get like a snippet in one of the archive scenes of that character being an intern for the two creators of the thing. And he gets kind of like shot down and dismissed. And it's like, okay, well, I guess that's his motivation. It's really, really thin. Mm -hmm. Well, the motivation for both of them, they have plan a secret plan that is actually detrimental to people and society as a whole. Ready Player One, his plan is to incentivize their screens. And what's the line? I can put ads up to 80% of the view space and sell all that ad space before people start having seizures. And in the Muppet movie, he's pretending he's going to make a um, museum. And instead, he wants to drill for oil. So they both have an alternate plan. Yeah. But as far as character motivations in... Ready Player One, we see him like, oh, he was an intern and he got dismissed or he got like they didn't pay attention to his ideas. So now he's going to take it over because how dare it's very, very thin in the Muppets. There is a deleted scene of Chris Cooper as a young person having this condition where he can't laugh. And that's his whole thing. And people love the Muppets and like he's watching the Muppets with his family as a young kid, but he can't laugh at the jokes. And that's why during the movie, he like looks at those guys and says, maniacal laugh, because he can't laugh. Well, it's funny because they the, actually say that in the film. And it's at really the weird. At the very end, the yeah. dragon guy is like, you can't laugh. And there's no, there's no setup where there's like, they just cut it, whether it was because they didn't want the character to have any kind of sympathy or they just cut it because it was a kid's movie and they had to get it under 90 minutes. I have no idea, but they just, that part's not in it. That's really and so weird. There's, there, it's very strange. Like the villain is absolutely one dimensional in the Muppet movie. And even though they wrote a scene where it kind of made him a little interesting they cut it and so there's just no context for this weird dude <laughs> that hates the muppets and can't well, i mean m- money is a motivator we we can believe in the capitalist society we live in that money is enough of a motivator without a, a chippy backstory well sure but you can get money in a million different ways this guy mm-hmm. is getting his money by destroying the muppets just like the yeah. other guy's getting his money oil, by man. destroying the the other the, you the, seen the beverly movies. hillbillies it's just oil that's all I kept telling myself. Like, it's just oil, right? Like, it's the, it's a get rich quick scheme. Buy this plot, drill for oil, boom, I'm rich. But yeah, that's, that's really strange. You mentioned love interests. It's a little bit different in the Muppet movies, right? Walter doesn't have a love interest as a puppet. You Correct. have to extrapolate that to the brother. That's where they are not similar. This is true. See, I think of the love interest as being between Kermit and Miss Piggy, which they have. There is a scene in that movie with Kermit and Piggy walking down the streets of Paris, having one of the like most adult relationship conversations I think I've ever seen in a movie, especially a kid's movie. It was just out of nowhere, them talking about their divorce and separation and why they're not getting along and their deep feelings of how her love for him isn't enough because he wants the whole world to love him. And when she acts certain ways, it makes him lash out and hurt her. Like it's, I was like, where did this scene just come from? You can compare that to the relationship drama in Ready Player One, where in one scene, she's got like a little bit of like a rash on her face and she thinks that he won't love her but he still does and then they make out it's not great <laughs> <laughs> not a good come you're not winning me with that comparison i wanted to note that scene you were just talking about rob mm-hmm. is also like the only time kermit wears clothes true he's got that turtleneck because they're because kermit really and he has like a turtleneck and like a coat over and a blazer it, right? yeah, yeah. For sure. yeah yeah, yeah. It's crazy. it is and so it's like very adult <laughs> It felt very natural. I think 
Kermit and Piggy have those kind of things in other Muppet movies. They certainly did it in the shows. In, in the 1970s, 80s television show, that you didn't get those scenes. But I want to say those were, that was a pretty familiar... Like, oh, yeah. It's always been on again, Piggy. off again with the yes. two of them. But yeah. as the lore has grown over the decades, and like sometimes you see them and they have kids, and sometimes you see them and there's a big wedding scene, but then we always start from scratch with every movie of like, how come they're not together? She's off doing something and he's still being an entertainer and they're not together or they're separated in some way. And this movie really just took it up to 2008 and (laughs) modernized their relationship for sure. So we have kind of this, you know, need to stop the evil plot from happening. We have this area of love interest kind of things happening. What's another thing you want to shine a light on between these two movies? I have one. <laughs> I put I put that they're both heavy in pop culture references. 100%. Both of them very, very heavy. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. and needing that to push the plot along as well. What was clever in Ready Player One was that I found myself trying to solve the puzzle with them. So when they're in that scene where they're looking at the movie catalog and they're reciting the clue and the shining comes by, I'm like, oh, Stephen King hated the shining. It's got to be that clue. Like I found myself invested in, it was so pop culture and I am the heavier on the pop culture, I think, between you and me, Rob, that Mm -hmm. uh, I found myself trying to solve the clue with them when the movie allowed it. Did you have time to do that? Because I felt like the movie doesn't give you very much time to figure out those things or to be led along there. They just explain it as they go. I recognize it instantly, right? Because they're reciting the clue as VHS tapes were swiveling around. So like two of them had swiveled around and they were reciting the clue over and over. Like they did it two or three right. times. Hate like something by hated by the master or whatever that clue right. was. And the second the shining popped up, I knew. For me, that was an instant get. But that clue was wrong. No, that clue was right. But that was in the ballroom at the Overlook Hotel that's in The Shining. Well, I watched it twice in two days because I actually really enjoyed Ready Player One. I really oh, then that's really? a great conversation. Tell me why you really enjoy play- Ready Player One because I think it is garbage. <laughs> Am I going to list it as one of my favorite movies of all time? No. Am I interested in reading the book? Probably not going to read it now. I was entertained. I had that same, if not stronger, ping of nostalgia that the Muppet movie gave or the Muppets gave me. And like I said, I found myself entrenched in trying to figure out the puzzles with them, Mm. right? Of course, it was a lot spoon fed. I didn't have to do a lot of thinking. There wasn't a lot of those light bulb moments like with The Shining. And I also texted you in big capital letters. Thanks a lot for the warning because I'm by myself at 11 o'clock at night watching it for the first time and they're freaking walking through The Shining. And I know all the things that they're going to encounter. Brilliant that they put him in that picture. Like, you have to know a lot about The Shining. I really loved that whole series, even though I was terrified. I love that whole series because there's so much of The Shining that was thrown into there. And some of it very subtle. Like you were saying, Rob, like some of it they they throw out there and, and you just take it for what they feed you. But if you know a lot about The Shining, you know some of the bigger background stories to it. And I found myself constantly doing that throughout the movie to the extent that because I rented it, I didn't buy it. I rented it. And, you know, you've got like 48 hours. So the second night, which was last night, I watched it again just to re-experience some of those things and catch new things. And the more you watch it, there's more and more and more. It's predictable. It's a teen movie. Would I put it in my rotation to continuous, continuously watch? No, but I, I was entertained and I enjoyed myself and I loved all of the um, orchestral, the little Robert Zemeckis heart that goes through there when they're uncovering clues or figuring something out. Like I was entertained. I thought it was really, I thought it was really great. I think you're right in that. I think it's definitely a good like if you've got if you've got the knowledge and you know what all the thing is you can definitely catch up and i think that's very fun but i think what we're sort of saying is that it's not very successful as a movie or as a story it's okay it just makes a lot of like very tropey mistakes I think what Annalise gets out of a scene like The Shining is the same thing I get out of scenes in The Muppets where they're, where they're right. doing those throwbacks to those yes. things. And I think that's yes. also a great comparison. I think that is where it is most successful for those people for which get that. 
it's also hard to compare because the Muppets is a, it's a musical and it's a comedy. And so you get away with a lot more because the plot is just there to get you from joke to joke and from musical number to musical number, where in Ready Player One, it's trying to tell a story. And I think the mistakes that it makes is the same mistakes the book makes where it just explains too much. There's a scene yeah. where they kidnap the CEO executive guy by making him think that he's still that he's in the real world when he's still in the virtual reality world and they show that in the uh they show that in the scene as soon as he like wakes up and he sees the guys there and they're all like they've got you know fancy suits on and they're in this place and you're like oh they're they're messing with them and then they kind of do another little thing where the door opens or something so it like lets you know as the audience and then they explain it out loud and then they explain it out loud again yeah yeah. <laughs> like it's like come on movie it really underestimates the audience in places like that and then it's also one of those ones where i hate it when a movie has a bad ending you know you're you're going along for the ride you're suspending your disbelief and then they just don't stick the landing and one of the most annoying things about this movie to me is at the end the movie is ending and they just like tack on this thing at the end of like oh and also we shut down the virtual reality world two days a week so that people won't have more screen time thanks standards and practices and it's like i hate it i hate it so bad that's a i watched that scene and i was i astral project to the meeting room where they were showing this script to the executives and like some like boomer studio executive was like you know this movie is pushing the agenda that kids spend too much time on their screens you gotta put a message in there to stop them from doing that it's so annoying when they're on their vids how dare they andrew did you say you had read the book no I'm, I'm interested in if it's i'm not interested enough to read the book i'm interested if that's in the book right because yes and that was the whole conflict between Wade and the girl, right? You need to live with like, and I think her edgy backstory is so weak. Like, like my dad was, da, da, da. but you know, she yells at him at some point in their building relationship. You need to actually live in the real world. It character wise, it takes it from beginning in, not saying it's good, but there's a reason why that exists. I'm interested in if that's part of the book as well, but done maybe on a deeper level. I don't remember, but I bet some listeners do and will have opinions about that ending. And if it is true to the book or if the book goes an opposite way, yeah. or if it sucks as bad as I think it does. Honestly, to draw another comparison, like how you said, the Muppets as a musical and a comedy, the plot exists to take it from joke to song. I would argue that the plot of Ready Player One is meant to take them from reference to reference. Yeah. It's that like shallow and surface level of a plot. The wizard shows up and you need to get three keys to get the special object, right? Like it's not really anything. <laughs> no, but that, I mean, that's a classic plot and then they dress I mean, that's it up a, with... That's a Hollywood plot. Cool He's, it's, yeah, I mean, that's a plot same, yeah. tale as old as time, right? It's a it's a fetch quest, right. you know. I and which I like fetch quest plots. I think they're <laughs> fine, and I think I think it's a good simple foundation to then layer on your incredibly CGI world. I would say, Andrew, more than reference to reference, I think it also just takes you from virtual scene to virtual scene with just enough of them not in the virtual world in between. They're building up for the next big thing that has to happen in the Oasis. And that's all it is, right? Right. The Muppet movie is building up the next thing to have the next character have their song moment, which I had forgotten it was a musical even. It had been so long since oh, I'd seen it's it. A, it's a banging musical. It's got a yeah. ton of amazing things. Amy Adams, every time Amy Adams sings, she's just... She's incredible. brilliant. Yeah. She's so and good. they really cover how bad of a dancer Jason Siegel is in those scenes by having him freeze frame while they do the rest of the dance yes. and he goes to the next move. Like, it's hilarious. It's really, really funny. The thing I hate so much about Ready Player One is everyone live. This is this huge oasis. Everyone in the world is a part of this amazing, like, worldwide phenomenon. But yet all of our characters live in Columbus, Ohio, in the real world. <laughs> like, they're all yeah. in the same city. That's the dumbest thing ever. Even when you're in, like, the big battle scenes and you see, like, the like the Master Chief guys running around, then it flashes to a thing in the real world where there's, like, six guys all doing that same move on the sidewalk together in Columbus. So I'm like, that's the whole point of something like this is that you're brought together in these games from wherever you might be around the world. Not everybody lives in the same place on the same block. And that's such an easy fix, it's right? Dumb. You can just take them to a different place and film them doing that. And just like that, you've made it better. 
was it's so say. bad. Oh, and and the, con- the convenience of the extra life coin. That's a reference in itself, right? That's a yeah. video game joke. Like, it's okay, but yes, it definitely sucks. <laughs> yeah, it didn't. It was kind of like, eh, okay. We yeah. all live in the same city, and I happen to have a giant van with rigs in it that will accommodate all of us. <laughs> like, that's so dumb. And I, it it's really interesting to me that the movie puts so much emphasis on this team, the high five, if you will. It's a very, like, classic, like, five-man band setup, but there's only, like, maybe two and a half actual characters in there, to the extent where, like, you know, typically if you're making a group, people will have their different expertise. They don't really even have that. What is show the 11 year old actually bringing to the plot? Like, what's his role in that group? I mean, they, they call him out. He's, he knows yeah, how but to fight. He doesn't though. But yeah, he sucks. <laughs> He, never he goes fights. in and throws stuff and battles. In the big ending battle, he comes in and saves the moment at some moment. And then there's the other dude that meditates to the last moment. That guy didn't make much sense to me, but... All right, hold on. You're talking about my boy Dime. I'm Let me tell you about my boy Dime. The fact that he is so underutilized in this movie shows a lack of of understanding and respect of the source material on the parts of the creators. Now, hear me out on this one. I know you've got some gamers in your audience, Annalise. And so I'm calling out to you gamers. You know that if you are playing an online video game and there is a guy on your team whose name is in Japanese characters, he is going to carry you and your team on his back for the entire game. 100% of the time. And the fact that my boy... My sweet baby boy gets to be in a Gundam for 10 seconds and then die is so sad. Meanwhile, (laughs) meanwhile, the white kid just drives a car up the arm and takes him out in one headshot. Hey, he had a DeLorean. Don't mess with the DeLorean. (laughs) (laughs) Not realistic. No, not at all. I feel like the other characters, other than obviously Wade and I forget her real name, Artemis. Mm-hmm. I guess to some extent H, but he gets he gets sidelined hard halfway through the movie. Disagree. Annalise, how much better or how cool was it to see the Iron Giant in this movie after we That was going to be my next thing. Like, I know you loved that part. Not only just the reference to it earlier in the film, but the fact that they come back to it and that H comes, it goes into the Oasis and puts on the Iron Giant to help. For that final the battle, battle proceed, and yeah, absolutely makes and the, the ultimate, ultimate sacrifice. sacrifice. Yep, <laughs> <You're> right. <laughs> it's like a mini movie within a movie, right? To me, that is what was enjoyable. I hear you, Andrew. Like I can imagine in the book, the other characters had bigger parts. This movie just really honed in on Wade being he, Wade's going to be the guy. You knew it from the onset. He's going to be the guy, and it's just, and it just. Does it. There's so much to cram in there that the ensemble piece didn't really get its due, I think, is where you're, you know, with the Muppets, you get, once you get the Gonzo thing, like when we go see Gonzo at the, at the toilet place, and then he like hilariously has a button to blow up his entire life and move on, Gonzo doesn't do anything else, but we still got a great Gonzo scene. We get a great Fozzie scene uh, when we see what he's doing with the Moopits and it's mm-hmm. just the most tragic, like, heartbreaking thing ever. We get to see Miss Piggy and where she's at in Paris and all that kind of stuff. So everybody in the ensemble gets a good something, mm-hmm. even though they might not affect the conclusion of the plot. But with right. Ready Player One, you're right. We don't. We just kind of get a voiceover. A lot of things are tell, not show In that movie, we're like, oh, yeah, this is my friend. What's his face? He does this. And we just have to trust that that's true. Mm -hmm. Well, consider this, if you will. The Muppets was, while being a kid movie, was definitely made for the adults and the nostalgia. We don't need introduction or, you know, background to any of these characters. We know Animal and who he is and why he would be chained up and at an anger management class and no drumming. We know Gonzo is just an idiot and prone to accidents, which makes that whole blow up the entire factory funny. Wade doesn't meet these, the others in his band until it's crisis moment. So it also kind of makes sense. We don't know a lot about him because all he knows about these people is the online personas that they've given, which is kind of a cool revealing moment when he actually meets them in real life. But you are right, Andrew. It doesn't do a good job of then creating this high five. Like you have to just buy that at the end. And I didn't like that at all. Or suddenly they have a name and there's people with posters going high five, high five. It's yeah, like, how, right? did, no, <laughs> like I don't, how do they know? I don't, I don't because the high five, like that's a joke and it is a good joke. The running joke of him trying to high five 
high-five everybody and right. them, like, ignoring him and then calling the right. group the high-five is chef's kiss. I really enjoy that, that bit. Right. Oh, my gosh. But, yeah, I just, the fact that they all live in the same city just <laughs> makes me cringe. I hate it so bad. Especially because in the Muppets, they make it a point that they have to travel all around the world to get these different people. That's part of the, that's always part of the team, is the road trip. Oh my always, gosh. Well, always part of the formula. Last thoughts on Ready Player One and the Muppet Show, Andrew? I think that Ready Player One is a fun video game movie, and I think the Muppets is a fun Muppets movie, but also gets to be a good movie. I think my final thoughts will be that the more you live in the nostalgia for which is offered, the more you will take out of this movie. I forgive a lot in the Muppet movie as far as like plot and, you know, anything that actually happens because, because it's a comedy and it's a musical and we don't expect it, but also because I love all things Muppets and they can do no wrong in my eyes. And I think if that's where you're at with the eighties and video games, you're going to forgive a lot and really enjoy Ready Player One. Final thoughts for me. Ready Player One is more like the Hunger Games. What the Hunger Games does not have is the nostalgia piece. So depending on the mood you are in and whether or not you can forgive mediocre movies, you want some good nostalgia feeling. Both of them, especially for people like Gen X, people our age, and maybe younger millennials can really hit home with nostalgia feelings and images and sounds and thoughts of what it was like growing up pre-internet if you will pre-cell phones since you brought up that third movie again i'll also just end this section on a little bit of a challenge for anyone listening or wanting to think about that go watch force awakens it is also the same movie to the fact where r2d2 can't talk or do anything throughout the movie until the finale when he shows a hologram again and the exact same beats of Animal not being able to drum. And in the finale, he can drum again and save the day. <laughs> oh, man, I'm going to have to go back and watch that now. Yeah, watch Force Awakens next. You'll be like, these movies are all the same! We did it. Woohoo. How about you, Rob? What's the nerdiest thing you did this week? We were, I was surprised by Maria. She took us to Scum and Villainy in LA, just off Hollywood and Vine. Now, had you told me about this place before? No. Okay, because I I I wasn't sure. It was a complete surprise to me. But as I was thinking about it, I was like, I wonder if Annalise told me about this like three years ago and I just didn't remember. Okay, Scum and Villainy is a dive bar down by Hollywood Boulevard, which was very clearly just a small dive bar that somebody Mm -hmm. purchased. Mm -hmm. But what they did is they turned it into the Moss Eisley Cantina from Star Wars. The grungy yellow lighting, all the tables and stuff to make look out of stone, the entire aesthetic. They've just cobbled together all kinds of junk and painted it to be weathered and stuff. It's like going into Moss Eisley, but extra that way because it's a gross dive bar on near a mm-hmm, block mm-hmm. away from Hollywood Boulevard. I could not have been more thrilled to go to this place and be like, oh my God, I am in it. It's totally like Star Wars. And also, I think someone might stab me. Like, it was really <laughs> great. No, it wasn't that bad. It was, it was very nice. And all the people there were super cool. You could tell that there was like, there was like a table of a group of guys who like just got off work because it was five o'clock something. And that's where they came to like 
have a beer and get some snacks. There was obviously like a couple there who had just been to the Star Wars experience at Disneyland and then come here. He had his lightsaber with him and they wow. were in costume just having a total nerdy time just like I was. All the food and the drinks and everything have kitschy science fiction names, not just Star Wars. Like there's, you could tell it started off as a Star Wars, but then if they've expanded, there's all kinds of Harry Potter references and Lord of the Ring references and Marvel references and all this kind of stuff. So I was just tickled to to be in this bar that was the Moss Eisley Cantina and also meta kind of the Moss Eisley Cantina. Right. It 100% would do again with adult friends. <laughs> I mean, and that's... I that's... Go in there, I guess, until 8 o'clock, it's okay for minors to be in oh, there. Sure. After 8 sure, p.m., sure. it turns into like a bar and there's no no one under 21 allowed. So he was able to go there. He was not as thrilled as me. He kind of sat there on his phone like, I can't believe I'm sitting here in this bar with my dad. <laughs> but oh my God, it was so fun. And I was surprised by it, which was the best part. Highly recommend. Great place for a nerd best friends meetup. If any of your like LA friends and people that we've had on as guests before want to meet up. Yeah, I'm in. We add it to our list of things to do that are nerdy. The pictures you were sending me were just insane. Just the references. It was reference overload. Absolutely. On the menu and the drink menu and the food menu. And, and like you mentioned, all, just a bunch of different nerdisms that they've peaked with their, with their menu. It's pretty brilliant. And I can't wait to go. Yeah. So. Maria got a, this is the drink you're looking for super cheesy like some rum drink or whatever which yeah. was cool and i actually ended up getting the asgardian ale which was delicious it was like lime juice simple syrup a shot of jack daniels and then a mango cart beer wow it was one of the most delicious things i've ever had <laughs> Wow. <laughs> and Man. on the menu, I had a big old picture of Thor guzzling a giant beer. So, of course, <laughs> I yeah, uh, Yeah, it's good stuff. Andrew, what's the nerdiest thing you did this week? The nerdiest thing I did this week, like you were saying, Dad, uh, over the weekend, we ha- went on a trip to uh, the big city, Los Angeles. And while we were there... City of Lights. City of Lights, <laughs> where a kid can be a kid. We went to the Funko Pop store in Ooh. LA, which was an insane experience. That place it's like a Harry Potter house. It's way bigger on the inside than it looks on the outside. And there's giant, like, statues of the big Funko Pops and just rows and rows and rows of them. I bought, like, nine regular Funko Pops and then also a, a giant statue of Khonshu from the MCU and not really Egyptian mythology. Not this guy. But at least you haven't seen him. I don't know why I'm explaining this. He's fully a foot tall and he didn't fit on my shelf. So he has to go on top. Wow, yeah. that's a big it, Funko. It was the Funko Pop store. It, I thought like, oh, we're going to go to this store. So Maria dropped us off because we're like, eh, we don't want to pay for parking. And Andrew and I walked in there and I just was like, oh, oh. And I called Maria like, you, you're going to have to find a public parking lot and come in here. We're going to be in here for two hours. <laughs> it's so big. and It's got so many cool things to look at and take pictures with. And did they, they have their, their line of Funko Pop games too? They did. They had a whole game section. I mean, there's a Marvel section, which is a whole room with its own music and statues and places to take pictures. And then a DC room with the same thing. And then a Harry Potter place. There's a Game of Thrones area. There's an old school cartoons area. There's a Disney princess area. It's like, it is cavernous. It is huge. The moment I knew that we were going to be here for a while is when we walked in and there was like the to the roof diorama like Wakanda display with the actual moving waterfall with all with like the life-sized Black Panther right in front of it. I was like, oh, all right, at least bring us home. For me, it's just knocking out things on my nerd goals. I got to knock out. I added Ready Player One to my watch 23 new movies or shows. So that was good. Finished the first season of Cobra Kai. So I knocked that one out. I actually had some time over this four day week and we had to watch a few things and and then um, knock them off my nerd goals list. So climbing towards achievements. I love that. Well, maybe you can help me out then. Okay. My Hero Quest board still isn't done. Right. And I don't know why. It's like on the last legs, there's like three more rooms. I got to buy the magnets, but like, yeah. I, I got them. I can, I found them. I could buy okay. them. And I've got like three more rooms to print out of the like 21 that are on there. Like it is in the last steps, but yet it has gone unfinished for like a couple months now. And I don't know where my mental hang up is. I need a well, nerd you, psychologist. Help me. Why can't I finish you, my goals? You lost your momentum. <laughs> yes. And got discouraged by the magnets. Yes. So take the magnets out of it. We can't play this game, Rob, until you finish the board. I know. 
and all the minis are painted. I've got the box organizer. Like, it's ready to go. The app is set. Like, I want to play it. So do it. But I can't. I don't. I Everything keeps getting in the way. Like, you should what's, see what's my printing? project table here. What's printing? It's full of stuff. What's printing? What's printing right now? Yes. What's printing right now is a little set of, it's going to be like a garden slash farm. It's like little fencing and little garden boxes full of, um like, pumpkins and stuff. And then there's like a chicken coop and a pig pen. And I'm putting this together for uh, my D&D adventure where there's going to be, they're exploring this castle. They go outside to the garden area and there's a big fight with these, like, dryads and a awakened trees and stuff in the garden that come to life and so like oh that's coming up i need that so i started printing these old fences and these garden boxes for that cool scene okay so put it on your next okay <laughs> like don't don't interrupt the progress you're making on the thing you're working on to finish another project but it's next you're going to print out the last few pieces and once you start printing them you will get back into that groove you just you lost your momentum on it and I now did. you're thinking Hardcore. about other games yeah. i was i was painting on that thing i had like the process done the paints out now it's like been so long i'm like i don't even remember what color i undercoated them like i i don't know it's just ah you'll get your groove how many pieces is it, is it left 3 Six? It's probably like 12, pe- well, 12 pieces for the floor, and then I got to do all the walls. I mean, it's 48, 64 different things I have to print and paint all said and done, some smaller than others, but but I've done nine tenths of it already. Yeah. Just, I mean, <laughs> I know it's doable. Not knowing that there were that many pieces left, it's obviously not just like print it and be done with it, but pick the next room and print that room and do whatever next D&D thing or other print you have to do, then print the next room. Just add it in, just fold it in. <laughs> fold it fold in. It in. <laughs> you can do it. You have to remember, like, I'll put, we I'll put, can't I'll play post it up on finish. my computer monitor right here. Fold it in. Fold it in. Fold I, it in. We can't play. We can't play. I've never played Hero Quest, and by the sounds of it, I never will. So finish it. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> I love that. Hold it in. Boom. Hold, Hold it, in. it in. On our next episode, we're going to be talking about games, games of all kinds, and what is popular in gaming stores. We've got a special guest coming up. I have all kinds of questions to ask about that retail side, how he does his lending program, what the Kickstarter market has done to benefit not only gamers in general, but his store. I'm very much looking forward to this next episode. Remember to subscribe, share, and give us that five-star rating wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter at NerdBestFriends, or send us a message by writing to podcast at NerdBestFriends.com. Thank you again, Andrew, for being on the show. And listeners, thank you. See you next time. I won't see anybody. The movie we're talking about, of course, is The Muppets. No. (laughs) Why do you suck? Okay. Why do you suck? Who read the last one? Yes. Annalise, you're totally right.